can you introduce yourself to people who don't know who you are? My name is Sam Cohen. I'm a research physicist at Princeton University's Plasma Physics Laboratory. I teach plasma physics at the university and run a program for undergraduates and graduate students. I've been at Princeton for 44 years. My undergraduate and graduate work was done at MIT, a PhD in 73. Most of my work then was in atomic physics, not plasma physics. When did you make the transition from atomic to plasma physics? When I got the job. When I came to Princeton, I knew no plasma physics. Now I know a little. Your career spans a very long period of time, and you've worked with a number of very famous luminary people throughout the fusion field, including Harold Firth. Can you talk about him? Man was brilliant. He had lots of ideas that he published, and he also was able to give insightful advice concerning things that he just heard about that he hadn't paid much attention to in his own research. In my particular field of research, he actually made some seminal contributions. He's the person who I think gets credit for identifying the method that was first used to form FRC plasmas, field reverse configuration plasmas, ones that I work on now. He also, in his introductory course to plasma physics, gave a homework problem which has been central to how I study my plasmas now. So the, the, that course was a wonderful course. I didn't realize how good it was until 20 or 30 years later. He also was extraordinarily honest and far-sighted in understanding that tokamaks would be very, very big, very, very expensive. And he tried hard to find smaller approaches to fusion, smaller machines that uh, one could experiment with, develop, implement, test, so he had, he had great foresight to try to see what you could do besides the tokamak, which is currently the front runner for fusion research in the world. Did your career overlap at all with Lyman Spitzer? A small amount. That is, when I came to Princeton, he already left the plasma physics lab, and he was teaching back on main campus doing astrophysical research. I think it was either my first year or my beginning of my second year at Princeton that I decided to take a course with him. I lasted through about five or six lectures because there was so much in the course that was useful that when I heard something, I just went off to do research on it by myself. So I never did finish the course, but he inspired me to at least write one paper by what he taught in that course. It had to do with interstellar dust clouds and gas clouds and how light propagates through them and what atomic physics processes take place in those gas clouds. So I didn't know him except for the course, and I only took, I probably sat through half a dozen lectures. The physicists who were at the lab at the time spoke of him as though he was a demigod. All the brilliant ideas, they had nothing but the highest respect for him. You mentioned earlier about Harold Firth's predictions about tokamaks. And that's a good segue into the discussion about ITER. Could you walk us through your involvement with ITER back at the beginning? I think the year was either, must have been around 1987, and Dale Mead, who is at that time the head of the TFTR project, I can't remember his exact position, invited me to his office and asked me if I'd like to join the EATER team and work on the design of EATER, and I accepted. I thought that the activity would be interesting, but I really had no idea how really, really interesting it would be. I thought that the activity would be time-consuming, but I didn't realize how completely encompassing and consuming it was. So I started working on ITER roughly in 87 when the U.S. first made an agreement to work with the Russians and others on designing a machine. By the way, ITER was not the first attempt at this. It was preceded by INTOR, which was headquartered in Vienna. So the ITER project had a predecessor that probably lasted six years. I think Weston Stacy from Georgia was the U.S. leader of that project. And I remember the first organizational meetings that I went to in the U.S. One was held in Dallas. And before I went to the meeting, I was spoken to by Paul Rutherford, who is one of the leading theoreticians at Princeton. And he said that he and Harold were greatly concerned that the ITER project design was growing too large. I think at that time, the ITER design was someplace like three or four meters in major, major radius. And they said, you have to do everything you can to keep it from getting larger and, and try to make it smaller. But when I left the meeting, which was held in Dallas, the, the size of the machine had changed, but from three or four meters to five meters. And so it hadn't gotten smaller, it had gotten bigger. 
And by the time my effort on this finished, which was roughly 1994, it had grown to 6 or 6.2 meters. So despite Harold's suggestions and urging, I was unable to do it because people understood that tokamaks needed to be big. The team I worked on for EDA was called the CDA, the Conceptual Design Effort. That was followed by a more detailed engineering design effort, and the machine actually grew in major radius from 6.2 to 8 meters until they realized that the cost was well beyond what could be provided to them. So they went back to the 6.2 meter machine that the CDA produced. The 6.2 meter machine might have been called Eater Light, but I don't recall that exactly. I know the phrase Eater Light was circulating around that time. And there's a number of reasons why the size has to be so big, like anomalous transport, for instance. That's the main reason why, yes. To, to give yourself a safety margin in the confinement, you want the machine to be bigger. Can you explain anomalous transport? Let's pretend that you have a cubic meter of styrofoam. It has a certain thermal conductivity. If you put a blowtorch on one side, it takes a long time for the heat to, to reach the other side. It could take a year, but sometimes you might end up actually destroying part of the styrofoam and have channels flow through it, and maybe the heat from the blowtorch could actually go through directly. The tokamak had that kind of problem, that there were ways that the energy can get from inside the tokamak to the outside much quicker than what's called the classical theory of transport. So the classical theory of transport gives you good confinement, but anomalous can ruin that and can make confinement 10 or 100 times worse. In fact, when tokamaks were first built and stellarators were first built in the 60s, the anomalous transport was a million times faster than classical. Now tokamaks have achieved neoclassical confinement for the fast ions. Neoclassical means classical transport but in a torus. For electrons, there's still some anomalous transport. So the heat in the electrons leaks out faster than ideally. It leaks out according to what people think they understand. So that's an example of where theory and reality don't agree. No, I think the old theory doesn't match it. But the old theory was classical transport, but there are lots of people who have done really detailed calculations, and they come very, very close to predicting the behavior that's observed. So over the 40 or 50 years that tokamaks have been pursued, the theory has come much closer to explaining the results that are obtained. So in 94, you decided to move away from the eater effort. What was the right. thinking there? I worked on a particular part of ITER called power and particle control. That is, when the plasma starts to fuse and release energy, you have to take the energy out and convert it to something useful like electricity. And sometimes the energy would leak out in huge bursts. And both the steady state flow of energy and the bursts of energy were too great for conventional materials and conventional structures to handle. And we tried to think of many ways to avoid both of these heat loss support, but we really came up pretty empty. And I think, in fact, some of the more recent explanations for heat transport are even less optimistic than our studies were in those times. One of the problems with this type of heat transport is if everything works dim dandy for a day or two or three in a reactor, but you suddenly get one impulsive loss of heat, they can destroy a component and your machine is shut down for three months, six months, a year to fix it. So you can't really tolerate even a few of these accidental losses of confinement. So that was one issue. That was a major issue. The second major issue was tokamaks burn a fuel mixture of deuterium and tritium, and that produces a lot of neutrons. People like those neutrons because you need them to breed more tritium by absorbing them in lithium. But other people like me don't like those neutrons because they damage the structural material and they also activate it. So not only do you have problems that the structures you build don't last forever, and in fact some might only last for a month or two or three before needing replacement. And secondly, you have this massive amount of radioactive material. So the neutrons were a real big problem for me. I think those were the two main problems, the heat loads being very, very high and the neutron damage being very, very high. Occasionally, people would have ideas how to solve some of these problems or at least ameliorate them. And the trouble with the tokamak is that it's a huge machine. And to get any experiment tried, to have any new component built for it, can take years and millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to do. So I didn't see how to test things. We had come to a point that people were going to go ahead and build a machine using ideas that were current in you know, 1988, 1990. And if a wonderful solution came around 10 years later or 20 years later, you couldn't easily put it into the machine to test it.
I didn't like the prospect of working with such a large machine where you weren't readily able to test new ideas. So I wanted something smaller where you could try new things and experiment with them. It was a big, 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 big project. I should point out that I tried very hard to build a machine that could be used by Eater for testing the materials that were going to be inside it. And collaborating with a group of people from Princeton, from Livermore, from Grumman, we put together a large proposal for a machine called the Eater Diverter Experiment and Laboratory. And we made a proposal to the Department of Energy to build this machine. It's a long linear machine that would provide a huge amount of, of power load on surfaces. We can see if we could make components that would take the heat load that Eater was predicted to make. The machine was heated by radio frequency waves. The proposal was made to what's called FESAC, Fusion Energy Science Advisory Committee, and the vote was taken by the committee, and the vote was 1701. 17 against, nobody in favor, and one person abstained. Since then, a couple copies of this machine have appeared around the world, one in Holland, not quite as ambitious as mine, but, you know, probably within a factor of two. So I felt in some way vindicated. But what I liked about the machine was its design. It was a linear machine, so it was much easier to build, to assemble, to do maintenance on. What I learned in the design of this machine helped me move forward in the design of the FRC that I work on now. It wasn't a wasted effort. Well, unfortunately, the FESAC committee did not support the proposal. Fortunately, they did not support it because it forced me to think of something else. Right. Then you settled on what you're doing now. The idea to work on the FRC in some ways involved Harold Firth also. So I heard about the FRC effort that was still being pursued. It was a linear machine, which I really did like. It was like a mirror machine, but it had one added feature. It had closed magnetic field lines inside, which would improve the confinement. So I remember a cocktail party one evening at the home of Robert Budney, and Harold Firth was there. And he and I were chatting, and I said, by the way, I, I'm quite interested in FRCs because I think they have some benefits, and I think a lot of progress could be made with them. And Harold said, oh, yes, yes, I've heard there's some remarkable new results with them. I strongly encourage you to go investigate them. And he said, why don't you talk with Leonard Zakharov about it, because he's the person that he had heard these wonderful results from. So before I spoke with Zakharov, I immersed myself more and more in FRC so I could hold an intelligent conversation with Zakharov. And then I went to see him and I said, Leonid, Harold said I should talk to you about FRCs and what wonderful breakthroughs have been made in them recently. He said, no, 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 not FRCs, but RFPs. So Harold and I kind of misheard each other. And <laughs> so, but nevertheless, Harold, he gave me some encouragement to work on something different from what he really thought it was. But I had gotten deep enough into FRCs that I really liked them by that time. How would you explain the field reverse configuration, just anyone? People talk about the tokamak being a donut, and it's a special kind of donut because it has magnetic coils that encircle the donut. If you want to think of an FRC, the first thing you do is you throw away those coils. And the second thing is you shrink the hole in the donut till it's not there. Maybe it's better to think of the FRC as an orange. There's really no hole down the center of an orange. So I think an orange is a very good way of thinking of it. If you had your orange with an axis vertically, the current is perpendicular to that. And the magnetic field is mostly self-generated by very large current in the plasma. This orange is placed in a cylindrical container where there are magnetic fields around it. The linear part of this machine is that cylindrical container that, that contains the orange. And the orange is the magnetic field lines looping around the plasma? Correct. Exactly right. Okay, so the plasma is spinning in a loop. The electrons go one way and the ions go the other way. So they're spinning in opposite directions. Ah. There's not one kind of FRC. I want to make sure that that's clear. There are probably four, five, six different kinds of FRCs, so a whole family. And when you say the FRCs will work, do you mean all FRCs work as fusion reactors or only one or two out of the family? And that's a field reverse configuration. Correct. And that's different than a Ceramac. But a Spheromac is kind of like a second cousin. It's on the way between an FRC and a tokamak. What is the difference exactly? The most important difference is that a, a Spheromac has the addition of a toroidal magnetic field, a magnetic field in the same direction as a plasma current. The FRC doesn't have that. I've used the term Rotomac. I think I might have used it incorrectly. The problem is this. The FRC name refers 
to how the plasma was made in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Well, the Rotomac refers to how a similar plasma is made in these 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So it's how the plasma is made that really is the important thing. When it says field reverse configuration, it really refers back to experiments that were first done in, in the Naval Research Lab. And the way they made the plasma was they had a cylindrical magnet, and they had current flowing in that magnet, and then they reversed the current in that magnet. And in fact, Harold Firth gets credit for identifying that process. So the way the FRC was originally made was you very quickly reverse current in coils. That caused the field in the plasma to reverse its direction too. In the Rotomac, you always have the current in the coils and the external coils going in the same direction. And then you apply what's called a rotating magnetic field. And some people say that that causes current to flow because the magnetic field's rotation drags electrons around with it. That's probably an incorrect way to view it, but you know, it's a nice picture, so why not? And that's called Rotomac. That name, I think, was invented by Yayan Jones, who probably wrote a hundred or more papers on Rotomacs. I.R. Jones, I read a number of his stuff. I think that he died five or six years ago, which is too bad. Wonderful person. So you've built this machine today, and you're doing experiments with it. Can you describe the machine that you've got <coughs> right now operating in the lab? The machine is called PFRC, Princeton Field Reverse Configuration. And it's one of a series of machines. We think it would take four machines to reach net fusion power output. We built machine one starting in around 2001, and it ran for about seven or eight years. And we achieved much, much better results than we hoped for. And now we're running machine two, and we hope that that will get to its goals in a year or so. The main problem has been the, the lack of manpower on it. In order to do experiments properly, you need professional diagnosticians and operators and technicians. And our funding is roughly enough for one half a person per year. In fact, DOE reduced our funding this year by a factor of two, intending to stop the program next year. Luckily, NASA jumped in and has given us twice the amount of money that DOE was giving us, although most of it's aimed towards engineering studies for use of this as rocket engines. Less money in the physics, more in the engineering. I think that's really good because if you came up with a physics solution, but it was impractical from an engineering perspective, you would get nowhere. And to do the engineering at this level, I think is exactly the right way to go. We're doing this work with Princeton Satellite Systems. In fact, they're the lead on the project because they're the engineering arm of the effort. And it's been a wonderful collaboration. You're asking what my machine looks like now. So there's the center of the machine, and that's a plastic cylinder. It's a pipe, a plastic pipe about 10 inches in diameter and about 40 inches long. Made out of what? The material is called Lexan, which is a trade name for a polycarbonate. Why polycarbonate? In the machine, we need to have our vacuum vessel be electrically insulating because our radio frequency heating antennas are outside of the vessel. We want to keep the radio frequency antennas outside the vessel because it makes it much easier to apply the high voltages and high currents and to avoid breakdown. So we need an insulating vessel. Our first vessel was made out of glass, Pyrex, but we were afraid that it would chip, crack, implode. So we went to Lexan because it's a much, much tougher material. And we did a lot of tests on it, machining tests and stress tests and outgassing tests. And it's a, a wonderful material. Why Pyrex? I found it on the shelf. Wonderful. I was looking to build a machine. I found this vacuum vessel on the shelf. It had a lot of ports so we could put diagnostics in. And we could have used something else. Other people doing FRCs use quartz vacuum vessels, but they're much, much more expensive. They're $50,000 or $100,000. The, the Pyrex vessel can be $1,000 or $2,000, much cheaper. But it gives you worries if somebody drops a wrench on it or scratches it, a crack can develop and propagate. So ever since we started using the Pyrex, we were always afraid of that particular problem. So we went to something that you could hit with a sledgehammer, and it doesn't even say ouch. A reactor would not have Lexan, though. A reactor would be much, much hotter. We would replace the Lexan with something like boron carbide. It's a long tube, and inside you have a vacuum. Right. Inside the vessel, we have rings of metal, and these rings of metal are made mostly of copper, but we've embedded in them high-temperature superconductors. And we cool the metal rings by flowing liquid nitrogen through them. So we can make high temperature superconducting coils inside the vacuum vessel. 
and that helps confine the plasma in the radial direction. On the outside, we have our radio frequency heating antennas. They're unique because they have a special symmetry about them, and the symmetry is critically important to virtually every aspect of the FRC's operation. The symmetry helps drive currents in the plasma efficiently, helps stabilize the plasma, helps improve the energy confinement time in the plasma. We came up with this idea roughly in the year 2000. A group at the University of Washington tried our idea and improved their confinement by a factor of four or five. We tried it in our machine that improved confinement factor 10, and we think we can do better as the machines get hotter. So this particular symmetry, what we call it odd parity, is critically important to the machine's behavior and performance. When you say RF heating, I always describe it as microwaving a plasma. Is that a fair? It's not quite right because microwaves, the wavelengths are small. The waves are maybe anywhere from a few microns to tens of centimeters, but the wavelengths that we deal with are tens of meters, hundreds of meters. It's a little bit different. It is providing radio frequency energy, but when you think of microwaves, you think of waves propagating a long distance, like for cell phones, you have a tower a mile away, and it beams a signal to your cell phone. With us, the antenna is very, very close to the so the wave doesn't have to propagate through space. You actually sense the electric fields and the currents of the antenna directly. It's called near field instead of far field. And it's all technique to heat the plasma. Right, and to do it in a way that drives current, in a way that keeps the plasma well confined. Now, you talked about odd parity. Parity describes the directions of the magnetic fields that are created by our antenna. Parity is a property having to do with mirror reflection. When you look in a mirror, your nose and your image's nose could touch each other if you came close enough to the mirror. That's an even parity mirror. If you had an odd parity mirror, you would see the back of your head. <laughs> Not only that, but you would be upside down. <laughs> you put out your right arm, your mirror image would put out its right arm. In an even parity mirror, when you put out your right arm, the mirror image puts out its left arm. You can form a plasma, you can get it to bounce around between the mirrors, and then you can get an FRC to form in the middle. Are you claiming that far, or is there anywhere in that statement that you stop? We like to think we have an FRC because of a couple of less direct measurements. When we put power in the plasma, we measure how much magnetic field is generated by the currents in the plasma, and that agrees with having an FRC. But an FRC is a very precise mathematical and physical object. It has a skin over it, just like an orange has a skin, and that skin separates from on the inside and what's on the outside. We made one measurement about two years ago, which showed the skin, but we haven't been able to repeat the measurement partially because we're understaffed and not spending as much time on that. It would be nice to have that measurement done every time we turn the machine on. So do we really, really know we have an FRC? Well, the energy confinement looks like it's an FRC, and the magnetic field strength generated looks like it's an FRC, but we've really shown we have that skit. I'm not sure. What would you need in terms of money, diagnostics, or people to really prove it? I think we need what was had in the Tokamak program in the 1970s. In the 1970s, in the U.S. alone, there were over a half dozen Tokamaks. There was maybe two at MIT. At Princeton, there were two. The ST Tokamak was replaced by the PLT Tokamak, the ATC Tokamak, the PDX Tokamak, Oak Ridge had Ormac, General Atomics had Dublin D3. I think there was another Tokamak at UCLA. And each one of these Tokamaks was staffed with roughly 10 physicists who really, really knew their business and could really make detailed measurements. And they would measure temperatures of electrons by two or three methods, never trust one measurement. They would make measurements not at one point in the machine, but at 100 points in the machine. So you'd really be sure that you knew where the energy was. So we need roughly 10 professional physicists, and each physicist probably needs about a half a technician of support and maybe a quarter of an engineer of support. Roughly that scale, 15 to 20 full-time people working on it. And the funding we have now, we have probably three full-time people working on this. So a factor of five increase in budget would be roughly necessary. Given the money that you have now, what's your plan for the next year, two years, experimentally speaking? 
The main effort is to try to heat ions. We've heated electrons in our first machine in the PFRC1. Our goal was to get to electron temperatures of 100 electron volts. And we published a paper where we got to 150. We also had plasma discharges where we got to 200 to 350. I think we even had one discharge where it was 400 electron volts. 400 electron volts is 4 million Kelvin. And in the present machine, we've gotten to about five or 600 electron volts, 50% better. We want to get the electrons another 50% higher, up to 1,000 electron volts. The amount of power we have should be more than adequate for that because we've only been putting in 10 or 20 kilowatts of power, but our power supply can go up to 200 kilowatts. So very optimistic about heating the electrons to where we want to go. But we've never heated ions. We have to raise our magnetic field strength, and in order for the ions to get hot, the electrons have to get hot first. So the ion heating is going to be the most critical goal. That will be a fabulous goal to achieve in the next year or two. I have two very important questions we need to clarify. Have you recorded fusion? No, we're working purely with hydrogen. We have put other gases in. We put deuterium and helium and argon and neon, but we get the highest temperatures with hydrogen, the highest densities with neon or argon. But in this machine, we mostly run with hydrogen. In the next machine, we'll run mostly with hydrogen. And hydrogen is extremely difficult to fuse, only happening any abundance in stars. And it would take a bunch to run deuterium? We could run deuterium, but deuterium we expect to perform less well in the machine. Being a heavier nucleus, its orbits are bigger and would be less well confined. We think we'd have trouble with deuterium. The machine that we call the PFRC4, we would go to deuterium and helium-3. But the next machine after this one would still not be good enough to do any deuterium burning. The stability of the FRC. In the late 1970s, the greatest plasma physicist of his generation, a fellow named Marshall Rosenbluth, wrote a paper predicting that the FRC would be unstable. He actually stressed the stability of the Spheromac, second cousin to the FRC. And he pointed out that the configuration was unstable to what's called the tilt mode. Mm -hmm. The whole configuration would flip over if the plasma axis was not perfectly aligned with the external coils. And when it flips over, it would destroy itself. And he said this will occur if the FRC is operating in a mode where it's fluid-like, where the plasma behaves like a fluid. We 100% agree with Rosenbluth. And because we agree with him, we try to make our plasma where it's not a fluid. To be a fluid, it has to be highly collisional, which means cold and dense. We try to stay away from the cold, dense regime by making our plasma hot and tenuous, and we've been very successful there. And the second way is you make the particles have gyro orbits that are a large fraction of the machine size. If you think of your plasma as a cloth, instead of being layers of cloth that can slide over each other, it's really a 3D weave where particles from the inside can go to the outside and kind of hold the whole structure together. And so we try to operate in this kinetic mode. So far, our experimental results have exceeded Rosenblatt's prediction by a factor in excess of 100,000. So we've shown that we can do pretty well as far as this stability. When we go to larger and larger machines, we always design the machines to be in the stable regime. Other people go to bigger machines. Uh, there's a company called Trialpha in, in California, which is doing an FRC, which is much larger than mine, heated by a different method with a different fuel. And whether they will have instabilities, I don't know. Uh, right now, their pulse lengths are roughly 10 milliseconds, when our pulse lengths are 300 milliseconds. They're doing very well already. Whether they can do the same when they get to a reactor, we'll have to see. My question is, what do you think that the U.S. could do differently to accelerate, expand, and help fusion in general? There is a conception that governments are highly bureaucratic, and because of that, they're not very good at promoting research, and that really research and development belongs in private industry. There was a book written by a professor in England whose last name is Mazzucato. The name of the book is The Entrepreneurial State. And she points out how extremely well governments have helped the development of major technologies from the internet through solar power and wind power and so forth. So I agree with her that governments can help a 
law. Private industry really doesn't want to get involved until they can make money out of it. If you ask private industry to contribute to the token market, they would see a bottomless pit, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 billion dollars invested in something that's not going to make money for 100 years. I don't think that they would want to invest in the token market. But there are lots of private individuals who are making investments in FRCs because FRCs can be smaller, hence their development can be quicker. This company in California, TriAlpha, has funding from a number of private venture capital firms including support from a guy named Paul Allen from Microsoft. And then there's another fusion startup in British Columbia, which originally was going to use an FRC, and they have funding from a guy named Jeff Bezos. And then there's a third FRC company in Seattle with funding from a guy named Peter Thiel. These are companies where the funding that's going in is somewhere between five and fifty million dollars a year, much different than the billion dollars a year that's going into token banks. I think that there's room for both. The U.S. used to support FRCs. The U.S. supported FRCs in the national labs through 1988. Then they shut down the program in Los Alamos. There was a company in Seattle called Mathematical Sciences Northwest that started to do FRC experiments using rotating magnetic fields, and they then became part of the University of Washington academic program, and they were supported by the Department of Energy to about 2005, and then the DOE cut their funding. And the same time that they cut their funding, they cut funding several other innovative confinement concepts. There was a neuro machine in, at the University of Maryland. There was a linear machine at Columbia University. There was a levitated dipole at MIT. And DOA decided, gee, we are really into ITER. We need every penny you get for ITER. I think mine was the only surviving FRC in the U.S. There is a remaining spheromac in the program at the University of Washington with Tom Jarbo. But you can't really support a fusion effort when you have a half a person working. You really need a group of professionals. Probably each machine should have five or ten physicists. So I think that there ought to be support for a community of FRCs provided by the U.S. government. Because when you have a single culture at one place, you're not competing against somebody else. I like competition. I want people to have different ideas, different cultures. I want them to hear different sides of the story. I want to see them do different experimental tests and learn from each other. So I think there ought to be three, four, five FRCs in the U.S., each one staffed with a funding that can support ten professions. The last question, is there anything else that you want to add that we didn't talk about? Yes, two things. I want to talk about Aneutronic and I want to talk about small. As I said earlier, I left Tokamax. One of the reasons was the neutron problem. I think it's really important to try to make a neutronic fusion where the fusion reaction doesn't produce a lot of neutrons because the materials problems are extremely difficult. As much money and as much time has been spent already in the Tokamak plasma physics research, I would bet that finding the materials and certifying them for use in Tokamak reactors will take as long and be as costly, if not more. It's very difficult when you're building a commercial machine to certify every weld, every attachment mechanism, every bolt and nut to be able to withstand the neutron. So you really have to work to support a neutron fusion. Um, the second statement is about size. If the tokamak works, it would be suitable for central station power generation. And most designs show that these power plants are five gigawatts of power. They're very complicated devices. And if you look at which countries need these power plants, it might be countries like China and India. But the culture there for operating a machine like that doesn't reside in the commercial sector. It resides in the military. And I really don't like the thought of having the military control uh, civilian electrical power. And it's because these machines are so large, so complex, and so radioactive. If we can make small FRCs, one per village, and whether that village is in, in Africa, or China, India, or in Idaho, you can see it being simple enough that the town's folks can run it and safe enough. So if you have a problem, you can call in your Maytag repair man and have it fixed. So that's what we want. We have problems with our machine every day. Every time we run it, something goes wrong. We're standing right next to the machine. We can stop and fix it in 20 minutes or an hour. And we would try to make a machine that's so low in radioactivity that you could be within 10 feet of the machine when it was ready. When do you think we'll have fusion power? <laughs> I'd like to see a power plant that has produced net power in 10 years.
Is it possible to do it in 10 years? Not in Tokamak. When I started on Eater in 88, we thought we'd have Eater built by maybe 2010, 2015. And now Tritium won't be put in until 2035. There's another device that's been discussed that possibly can help ameliorate one of the problems Tokamak has, the Stellarator. A Stellarator was designed and construction started at Princeton about 15 years ago and was plagued by major technical and cost problems. Not because the people weren't good, they were the best engineers and plasma physicists in the world. They had seen other Stellarators come into fruition. The Stellarator is a really tough machine because of its twists and contortion to build. Now if you say, oh, but we built one in Germany, it turned out they were building this one in Germany in 1988. It took 20 years to build a machine that's not radioactive. Stellarators are very tough machines to build. I think a simple machine has to be the guiding principle. And the FRC really is much simpler than the toroidal ones. Would it be fair to say that the FRC shifts complexity from the engineering side to the physics side? Yes, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, I think physicists have to be the miracle workers. If you go to an engineer and you say, do what's never been done, that's not what you want when you're making a product for people to use commercially. You want to give engineers jobs they could do. If you say, we want to take out the heat, the engineer should say to you, we can tolerate heat loads of 5 megawatts per meter square. We can't tolerate 20 megawatts per meter square. And if you tell him you got to do 20 megawatts per meter square, he should resign his job and say, you're giving us something that techniques cannot do reliably. So you want to make sure the engineers are given a chance to do their jobs properly. The physicists have to do the miracles. Once you make a miracle one day, it becomes commonplace a week later. But the physicists have to come up with ideas.